Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for Secrets to Killer Sales Proposals. Um, my name is Olivia, I'm from Catalytic Consulting and I'm really excited to be uh, here with you today to share some of these secrets and thank you very much to Paul Stocks for having me. Um, with me on the call is also Jennifer, my, the Executive VP for Chorus and um, just give you a little bit of background um, I work for a company called Catalytic Consulting, and we specialize in helping software companies grow. So one of the ways we do that is through proposal management and writing services. So I've personally been involved with Chorus for about 10 years now. And during that time, I've worked with many wonderful customers and helping them not only get up and running with proposal management software, but also getting the best return on their investment and creating better proposals. So, um, and I also also have a background in sales where I spent nine long years before that. So I am um, well acquainted with a lot of the struggles and pain points that you are also probably all too familiar with. Um, and so today we'll be talking about how, um, how buying has changed and what modern buying is like in a new normal. We'll take a look at a small slice of the proposal development cycle and what you can do to really create the secrets really for, for great proposals is preparation process and personalization we've got some great tips for you there and then where does technology all fit in with that so if you have any questions uh, throughout this presentation please feel free to pop them on the chat uh, we'll address we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation and um, if not, then we'll definitely reach out to you afterwards. Thank you, Olivia. I'll pop off and you guys will hear from me a couple other times during the webinar. But thanks so much for joining us and thanks to everybody on the call. Thanks, Jennifer. Awesome. OK, so for the last two years or so, it's, it's, it's been quite, um, quite eventful, to say the least. And uh, there has been quite a, a few changes in terms of procurement practices and uh, procurement and buying has taken a far more strategic and important role in many organizations. So the whole way buying happens is, has changed somewhat. So where before procurement and buying processes tended to be focused more about getting the best possible deal at the lowest price and about compliance, with all the shifts and the major disruptions that have happened over the past two years, and in fact, continue to occur in many places today, their procurement has become a lot less transactional and much more focused on strategic objectives, mostly uh, mitigating disruptions and risk and about building resilience and sustainability. So as uh, procurement and in fact, as you step more into the enterprise space, the more stakeholders also expect evidence of more things like ethical business practices, uh, responsibly sourced products as part of your supply chain. Social responsibility is increasingly becoming a big theme and so is inclusion and diversity as it should. Then as with many other areas of business, uh, procurement has seen a huge acceleration in digital transformation over the past two years. Businesses all over have had to figure out better and new ways of working. And with procurement, there's been a need for more visibility and transparency and a lot more data driven uh, decision making and more automation in the buying process. So, what does that mean for you and your proposals and your RFP responses? Well, the first impact is that decisions to purchase involving more stakeholders are taking longer. So that's a direct result of procurement becoming, in a sense, the first guardian and gatekeeper to mitigating third party risks. And vendor assessments also becoming a lot broader in scope. So sales processes are becoming bigger, they're also becoming slower. And for some, this might mean that you have to go through more selection rounds. Um, for almost everyone having more stakeholders involved, has translated into more questions, more online research, more buyer interactions over a longer period of time. So you need fuel to keep the conversation going and maintain engagement and interest. And that fuel is content in a lot of sales documents. 
In a recent study, Forest Docs, uh, was a benchmark study that we came out then last year. Um, core stocks found that sales organizations, including bid teams, actually spent one third of their time creating sales presentations and proactive proposals. So that was quite a quite a high number there, just goes to show. So the other thing that you know, back to modern buying is having on bids and proposals is that formal bidding is pretty much all the highest value deals are going to go through a formal procurement process that includes an RFX of some kind. Uh, the higher value deals are more strategic and procurement departments are getting involved sooner in the process and also having a greater say in the process. So your proposals and RFX responses are having a broader audience than the immediate line of business you're probably targeting your product or your service for. So you now have to also consider all the professionals who might not be very familiar with what it is that you're offering, but who stack up one business against another for a living when you're crafting your proposal. So it is more important than ever that your proposals are easy to navigate, that they are clear, direct, to the point. Then vendor assessments are becoming more comprehensive and broader in scope. So sales proposals and RFX responses are having to check a lot more boxes to be successful. So how well you meet a client's functional requirements and how you come in on price compared to other vendors are still very important factors, but they are increasingly not the only considerations. There are so many other aspects of your organization that actually comes under scrutiny as part of a formal procurement process. So you need to be prepared for these. And this also means that you probably will need to collaborate more broadly with more people from different parts of your business to help you respond to these types of questions and requests. Be prepared also to respond to more RFPs as your organization grows. So there's a direct correlation between the size of a business and the volume of RFXs you're likely to receive. You don't want to turn down RFPs that you can win because of a lack of capacity. So as you consider improvements around your RFX response or proposal management processes, it will play, it will really pay you in the long run to employ strategies that will allow you to build capacity and scale so that as you're more successful, you can cope with the influx. And then finally, um, well, that's probably not the full list, but at least the top five that we're talking about today is that digital transformation and increased automation in procurement processes means that evaluation criteria are being much more uniformly applied. So the way decisions are made around whether to award the business are more informed, more transparent, more objective. And this trend is leveling out the playing fields and bidding is now more competitive than ever. So while good relationships with potential clients are and will continue to remain absolutely key, you can't count on that alone to win the business. It is also essential that you have a good differentiation strategy. So you stand up on the crowd and a key way to do that, which we'll talk a lot about in a minute, is through personalization. So with that background in mind, and let's move on to today's topic, which is building killer sales documents that slay the competition and that help you increase your bottom line. So before we go further though, um, we just had a quick poll and we'd love to hear from you about what types of sales documents you or your team produce. So do you work primarily on RFS responses, back to proposals, a bit of both, none of them? Let us know. We're going to be talking about both today. Um, it will be very interesting to see what the breakdown is over the call. Okay, so Olivia, I don't know if you can hear me pretty well, but there yeah. we're still collecting responses. But it looks like about 5% of folks on the call, 5 to 10, are collecting RFX uh, responses, and about 84% are selecting both. So it looks like okay. that's sort of the mix. I'm a little bit heavier on, on maybe the both side. Okay, fantastic. Well, we'll be speaking about both today, so that looks something like. 
Great, thanks, Jennifer. All right, so what we'll do then is we're going to zoom in on the proposal development cycle, just a slice of it, really. Um, and typically, there are many methodologies out there about bid management and the board of business development life cycle, and they're always represented in this circular shape, like a pie or a donut, which makes sense because it is a life cycle. It's a looping ecosystem, so which kind of continuously feeds on itself. Um, and it's really a continuous set of activities. It doesn't really have a beginning and an end, but they rather just work well together. So anyway, we're going to just deconstruct that a bit today and focus on one specific slice of the cycle. So I kind of flatten this out for the purpose of this presentation. Um, so that we can see it a little bit more from the perspective of the timeline. And so as with all timelines, there are events. And so I'm going to call this the sales event. And this is where something happens in the sales process that triggers the start of putting hands to keyboard and creating sales documents to compete for the business. So in the earlier stages of the business development cycle, the sales event is something that pushes your opportunity into the proposal stage. And this is generally after you've confirmed through a qualification process of some kind that they are a good fit for you and they have expressed sufficient interest in return in your offering and indicated that you might be a good fit for them. And so they're ready to take the conversation further. And that's when you create a product or sales proposal specifically for that client. So it's not generic like a brochure. It's about what you can do for that specific client and why they should choose you over other vendors to do it for them. Then as the sales cycle progresses and let's say you do well and make it through to the next round, then you might be invited to participate in a more formal procurement process where the client reveals more information about themselves and their needs, and they expect you to do the same, and in fact, reveal a lot more even in return. And so now the ball is in your court. You decide whether you want to bid or not, and if you are going to bid, then you generally work and collaborate as a team to respond to what is essentially a questionnaire full of questions that seek to understand how well you can meet their very specific and detailed requirements, um, that will also tell them whether you comply with the level of security and data protection they expect, if you offer a decent level after sales service, and so on. So although these are two very different kinds of proposals, they both require a level of preparation, they require a good process, and a lot of personalization, which is what we'll have a look at next. Before we do that, I'm going to split the timeline um so that we have a before we, we start actually creating the proposal and then what happens during the proposal creation now in the before stage um this is the preparation phase and it's really all about getting your team ready to win business it's the foundational things you do before you actually start writing and producing proposals and RFP responses then there's the process now technically speaking Every business activity forms part of one process or another. But for us here, we're way more interested in seeing how everything comes together to produce those killer sales documents that bring in revenue after the opportunity has moved to the proposal stage or after the RFP has landed. So for us, we'll define process more narrowly as the proposal production process. It's a lot of peace. So just kind of shorten that to process for this one. And then finally, there's, and in a typical timeline, there's personalization. So really, this is very uh, critical if you want to win. So some organizations see personalization as something which you kind of tack on towards the end, or that marketing does to target customers in B2C selling situations, and not really something that applies to B2B, but that nothing could be further from the truth. Really, there is a crossover and the expectations that decision makers have from their personal B2C buying experiences and that they carry through to their B2B buying experience. And there's plenty of research that supports that. So for example, in a 2020 demand gen report about B2B buying behavior, 212 B2B buyers were asked which aspects of the purchasing process had changed over the past year. 
And among the top three responses received, an overwhelming majority, 76% of people said that they expected more personalized attention from providers based on their specific needs. With more stakeholders involved um, and in the process and more factors to consider when making a B2B purchase, the process of buying has gotten very complicated for buyers and more difficult to navigate. So that is why personalization is even more important than before. So in a recent Gartner study on changes to the B2B buying journey and its implication for sales, Gartner predicts that over the next five years, the best sales organizations will equip their revenue teams to engage customers very differently with information. What they said was that sellers will pivot from being the source of information to helping customers instead make sense out of everything they're learning, irrespective of source. I'm paraphrasing a bit. Um, our data shows the sense, sense making approach dramatically outperforms more classical sales approaches. And so sense making fills a critical need for customers, effectively focusing customers' attention on the most critical considerations for their organization. So they need help to navigate this process. And also in another study, this one by Salesforce, reported that 72% of B2B customers expect a deep understanding of their needs reflected through personalized experiences. And in fact, 68% said they expect a demonstration of empathy. So what personalization really says and really tells your client is we understand you. And because we understand you, we know what you need and we know how to solve your pain points. And because we empathize with you, you can trust us to have your back and to put you first. So personalization makes your proposal more credible. It helps you earn that coveted trusted advisor status, and it makes life easier for buyers and for evaluators. So you're not overwhelming them with too much information. You're giving them exactly what they need, and you're doing it in a way that talks directly to them and not to some generic audience. So personalization is really critical. The challenge though, is that personalization is very time consuming and the bulk of the personalization effort typically takes place during the production of a sales proposal, kind of tacked on towards the end. And that is a really bad time to do it because you're typically up against a deadline and you don't actually have that much time and yet it's so critical. So to mitigate that problem, the solution is to spread out the personalization burden and in fact, make personalization a priority throughout the proposal development cycle. And so if you do this, you'll see that you're shifting some of the effort over to before the sales event occurs. And this is really good because a lot of the foundational stuff happens there as part of the preparation. It's work that you do from time to time and it gets you set up and ready to be reused again and again, multiple times during the, in the, during the creation phase. So I'll give you a few practical examples on how you can do that, but let's first talk strategy and then board strokes. And the first secret is really making the three keys work for you. So if we have to kind of zone in on what do we focus on when we think about preparation, process, personalization. So the top three things to focus on in preparation is increasing efficiency. So turnaround times are faster. You want to also focus on ways to build capacity so that you can handle more RFPs and more sales proposals. You want to improve quality so that win rates go up and that's a continuous process. And then during the actual writing and development of the proposal, whether it's proactive proposal or response to an RFP, you want to make sure that you've got an effective collaboration plan where everyone knows what to do, where and by when, probably even more critical for RFX responses. You also want to have visibility and accountability into all the work in progress so you stay on top of deadlines. And you also want to have the right tools that make it possible to produce beautiful documents that are both visually compelling and easy to navigate. 
and that allow you to do that in the fastest amount of time possible. And then as for personalization and where that fits in, I would say that it should actually be absorbed into the creation and the process phase um, and really be your focal point throughout. And so in the preparation phase, you can help your personalization efforts by automating your content and your templates. And that will free up value, free up time, which is in fact very valuable um, for strategic shaping. And that's what you would do during the, the, the process of actually creating your proposal. So talking about freeing up time, if you had a quick poll, just for fun and make sure you stay awake, if you had a superpower that gave you one extra hour to do with as you please, right before a proposal deadline, how would you spend it? There's a quick poll. Would you be checking for errors? Would you be chasing down sneeze? Would you be making your proposals more beautiful? Uh, would you spend it on personalization, on strategic shaping? Or would you be far, far away from your desk? So I'll give you a minute to respond and then Jennifer can tell us what, what the responses are looking like. Okay, Olivia, we're still getting some votes to come in, but it looks like the majority of folks are picking personalization, which probably isn't a huge surprise. And then second highest is checking for errors. And then okay. third place it's kind of tied between strategic shaping and making it beautiful. So I'll go ahead and share those with everybody. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, that's super interesting. And I'll get to why that's super interesting in a moment. All right, so let me take you through some preparation secrets. So as we talked about three different goals to keep in mind for preparation. So for your first goal of increasing efficiency, so turnaround times are faster, practical strategies on how you can increase efficiency are firstly to set up reusable knowledge libraries stocked with ready to use content. So teams don't have to create any new content and responses from scratch or you try and avoid that as much as possible when it's crunch time. You can also optimize the way that your content is stored. A big challenge is that teams can't find what they need fast enough and they can't find it easily. So that is something that you can, uh, that most organizations, uh, I, I, never, I always think that it's never organized enough and you can always do better, but you can really, uh, it pays dividends to spend a bit of time focusing on findability, otherwise your content doesn't get used. Um, and then you can also leverage AI and machine learning by setting up Q&A libraries that use AI to automatically search for answers to questions in vendor questionnaires without you actually having to manually search at all. That's where technology comes in. Then for building capacity to handle more of these. So faster turnaround times, you, if you do the increasing efficiency bit really well, then that will automatically free you up, um, free up some capacity to deal with more RFPs and to put out more proposals. But there are some things that you can do as well from a team perspective to help you build that capacity. And you don't wanna wait for the RFP to land or for you to be in a critical situation where this proposal has to get out and you're still figuring out who's going to be doing what. So it pays to form tactical teams around each major knowledge domain if you can. For example, a security response team, uh, have a team of people that are uh, identified for answering professional services questions, for, for instance. Um, and you also want to um, you also want to be mindful that SMEs have got other day jobs that they need to worry about. So you want to build a redundancy wherever you possibly can to ensure that there's always at least one person in the group available to respond and help you with RFPs and, and with the proposals. And then also the other thing is really it's all the culture thing, you're cultivating buy-in. I mean, no, people don't get very excited when it comes to them as uh, RFP questions generally, uh, but there are ways that you can, you know, kind of celebrate the wins and you can incentivize RFP collaboration and make it maybe a little bit more exciting than I have a deadline and I need to respond within one day and 
by the way, you know, can you hurry up? Um, that's not a great way to do it. So if you can build capacity outside of the RFP landing, then that can really help. Then also for improving quality so that win rates go up, I would recommend having a re retrospective after each RFP or strategic proposal submission and learn from the team what they thought went well and what didn't so that you can improve on that. It's, it's the best practice to do that. We also definitely want to incorporate updates and feedback from your SMEs into your reusable content and implement a formal review and approved process or some kind of workflow that all your content uh, must go through on a regular basis to make sure that it is kept fresh and up to date. And what you also want to do if you want to improve quality is you need to measure what's working. You need to see what's helping you win, um, how effective your collaboration is, how well your content is performing. So that's where your metrics come in very much for the quality. Now for process. So this is the part where we were talking earlier, really, proposal production process. So an effective collaboration plan where everyone knows what to do, where and by when. So now that you've laid the foundation of preparation, it's time to execute. And so what you want to do is activate the tactical teams as early as possible in the process so people are prepared. If you need to negotiate availability, um, but ensure that at least each knowledge domain has got at least one SME available to assist. Clearly articulate what is expected and by when. For SMEs who know the drill, usually digital channels are enough, but for SMEs who might be a bit new to the process and if you need to kind of like rally the troops, um, get people together on the call to run through it. Creating clear written assignments and review assignments for due dates are also very important. Um, once again, it, it comes down to good communication. And when you're giving due dates out and, and tasks must be done, it's always a good idea to add a little buffer in case things slip so that there's time to fix it. So with RFPs, that's even more critical because missing an RFP deadline is just simply not an option. Most of the time, it's immediate disqualification if you do. And then you would have wasted a lot of time and money and effort if you were bidding and then you could have the deadline. And then of course, use tools that help you or that allow for teams to co-author. Um, so co-authoring tools make it possible for more than one person to work on the proposal at the same time, perhaps on different sections, but it really helps with collaboration and speeding things up a lot. Then on the deadline, so here you want visibility and accountability, and you want to have a way to track overall response completeness. How well are you tracking as a team? You could do this manually in Excel, or you could use specialized tools for that, which is what I'd recommend because then the reporting is instant and you're not wasting time on manual tasks. I would also really, um, again, what team management is, is schedule regular check ins. And if you can have dedicated digital channels, so maybe it's a, it's a channel on Microsoft Teams where you post updates, but it's a central location where people can get all their main communication. It's far more effective than email trails where there's a lot of people on email trails. It gets very confusing and very messy very quickly. And then beautiful proposals. And by that we mean not just pretty to look at, but well-designed. Um, that are easy to use and really easy to navigate for the evaluators. So you want to have a nice consistent and easy to navigate structure. Of course, you, if the clients provide a structure, you always follow theirs first. It's not about you, it's about them. Um, you can always add to that structure. The clients provided the, a document for that, but, but otherwise really well-designed yeah, is it's not just visually appealing, it needs to work for you. And there are some tools out there that um, have got a publishing process where you respond to the RFP and then you publish it to a template. And this can be quite time consuming. And what you see is not always what you get. So you can end up running around doing a lot of last minute formatting issues. Uh, we're fixing last minute formatting issues, and that's also something that you want to do 
when it's crunch time. You'd much rather spend that personalizing, which brings us to our next part. So here are some tips and secrets for personalization. So in the preparation phase, uh, what you can do is you can, with automation, fast track the personalization process. So if you build automation into your content and into your templates, you can automate pretty much all the most basic personalization tasks, like merging in the right customer's name and all the right places in the sales document. You can avoid a lot of errors in that way. You can also do things like set up um, automated content recommendations um, so that the basically the, the right content gets recommended to the right people to use at the right time based on things like the opportunity information or the RFP information, um, the stuff that's known about the client. So for example, if the client is interested in product A, belongs to product, sorry, to industry C and is based in country C, then you have, uh, you can save teams a lot of time and from having to dig around for the content they need by just serving up their content to them based on that. And so that technology comes into play there. And then of course, you want to also reuse your team's hard work by saving the shaped content and expert contributions. We talked about that a little bit earlier under the, the collaboration preparation. But the, the, after the proposal has been submitted, you can take the time to, and in fact, you should take the time to um, go and save the content that's been shaped uh, for other customers that have a very similar profile especially if you like it to encounter this type of customer or these types of questions again in the future. So that is something that can really pay good dividends later. And as time goes on, you can get more and more effective because you've got a better and better arsenal of content for different scenarios. Now for the process part, um, you have five strategies for shaping your sales documents. So the first of these is use the same language as your clients. So for example, if your client calls a quarterly review meeting a PBR, then you change your language and you also call it a PBR. It's all about relating to your customer and making sure that they know that you are hearing them and you are sharing the same language. Uh, the next point is uh, strategy is to, to use headlines and write for scannability. And the, the reality, really, and the irony, actually, uh, when you think of the effort that goes into writing sales documents, is that people don't actually read every word of your proposal. Most people just simply don't have the time. And so what they do instead is they'll just kind of skim through it. They'll pause to read a few headings, a few pull-outs, bullet points, maybe a caption underneath a picture or an image. Um, and so a lot of, if you don't use a good, uh, if you don't write in for scannability, a lot of very, very valuable content can be lost in the proposal. So news networks have a clever way of doing that and of conveying the most important information first. And you can do exactly the same in your, in your proposals you can have these headlines. So if you consider the first two sentences in an RFP response or the first few lines in each section of a strategic proposal as your headline, if the client stops there and doesn't read further, it's okay. You've conveyed the most important information up front if they want more, then they can go on to read, um, to continue reading. And if the first two sentences are highly personalized about them and to the point, then you've probably already done a good job. The next thing is person of competition. So if you happen to know who else competing for the deal, you don't always know that, but uh, you might be able to infer it uh, from some of the questions you receive. You can use this to your advantage by highlighting your competitors' weaknesses uh, based on how it relates to your client specific requirements, but without obviously ever mentioning those competitors by name. You don't want to give them unnecessary airtime. But for example, if you know that it takes the competition two weeks to deliver what you can deliver in two days, and the turnaround time is important for that client, you can say something like, 
don't wait two weeks. We guarantee delivery in two days. And there you have it, you've ghosted the competition. What you also want to do, what you want to do, especially now with, with um, the modern buying, uh, the, the cognitive load is just so huge and there's so much to, information to absorb and more stakeholders. You don't want to make evaluators have to infer whether they meet a requirement, whether you meet a requirement or not by reading a very long paragraph of, explana of explanations don't refer to an attachment. So providing a very clear yes, no, or partner response within the first two sentences of your RFP response, as if you were having a conversation with the client and they'd ask you that question over the phone and uh, make it obviously about them, but be very clear about whether you support things or don't. You could also be dealing with evaluators who don't really know the product that you're selling or the, or the, the service very well. And then, of course, uh, you always want to tie your features and benefits to what the client is trying to achieve. So they want to know how you're going to help them meet their objectives and solve their pain points. So when you respond to requirements and there's a chance for you to tie that back to all their objectives, that's absolutely golden, you should do it. And in fact, go and put it in bold and, and call outs and, you know, so it's really unmissable. Okay, we've got five minutes left. So I'm gonna take you very quickly through the essential place of technology. Things. So going back to kind of three P's and how everything kind of fits together. If you want to get really good um, at doing all of this, you're going to need a sidekick and you're going to need some technology. Um, and the kind of things, the capabilities that are going to help you get these three keys right are full lifecycle content management. You, you need to be able to fully manage content. That's one of the key things for, for preparation. You're going to want to have automation, automate anything that you possibly can so that you've got more time to focus on the strategic stuff. You're going to want to have a nice project workspace where you can collaborate, um, where you can keep tasks together, where you can have notifications, you can co-author, you can see how you're tracking towards completion. You want to make sure that your teams have got access to knowledge libraries and templates recommendations um, that you are also passing on the automation benefits to them so they can reuse that automated content. Uh, use AI to do things like auto search and answer. Um, useful integrations as well into everyday tools definitely help. Um, so authoring tools like Microsoft Office. If you're collaborating with people and they can work in their office, in their Microsoft Office that they already know, you'll get more collaboration out of them. Um, also, tools like CRMs um, and uh, collaboration tools like Microsoft Teams, for instance. And of course, cherry on the top is secure track sharing. What happens after you send a proposal? Do you know if people are actually really engaging with it or not? So this is where technology comes in. Now, of course, this is a course docs webinar and I'm very biased. So we can talk about where this fits in with, with Forest Docs. And of course, Forest Docs happens to have a fantastic set of capabilities that does all of this and more. So I've got a few quick screenshots that I'll take you through. Um, but basically, the automation in Forest is so simple and yet so powerful, um, where you could have just text within documents can be used as merge fields for replacing placeholder text with real customer information. Uh, you can create smart rules inside of real word templates and PowerPoint templates um, just by using an add-in that will automatically tailor the messaging to the sales situation and to the customer's needs. Then there's a wonderful um, feature called Pursuits that allows you to manage everything as a project and if in one place you've got content recommendations, you've got all the documents that you're working on, the ability to do more searches if you need it, um, to track all the assignments, um, see the comp overall completion, um, who else is working on the, on the proposal with you, and so much more. 
you can of course co-author and work directly in Microsoft Office, which I think is one of the huge benefits of Chorus Docs. Uh, there's an add-in that just loads up on the side, but otherwise, I mean, it's you are like, literally working in original Word and PowerPoint and Excel as you would any other document. Uh, there's literally no learning code. And what the panel does is it helps collaborators start on their to-do list and progress things through as they ever work. There are CRM integrations for Salesforce and for Dynamics. They are a fantastic set of comprehensive uh, custom reporting uh, capabilities available. Uh, there's even reports on for each content item course keeps track of whether content is helping you win deals. If so, what was the value of those deals that was that we won, and also what the win rate of that content is. So you can start identifying what real winning content is uh, and what's helping you. And then of course there's the little answer AI. Um, which I think is super exciting because it allows you to select questions in a document or in a spreadsheet and within seconds um, after you click on an answer button you just see the answer the draft answer is coming in so you don't even have to search manually so that is a real game changer and definitely worth checking out if you haven't already okay so I've we have uh, against the time here so uh, we do have Forrest has put together a fantastic ebook for the ultimate guide to mastering rfps and sales proposals um you're welcome to go and get it there's a short url there or you can scan the qr code and if there are any questions i'm happy to sit down and take them hey olivia um the only question i have so far and maybe folks need to put a few more in is just around will the presentation and the slide deck be made available to everybody and as as you all know we will follow up with everyone because we have folks registered that couldn't make the actual time so we'll send the full recorded webinar to everybody and anyone that wants the specific slides we can also forward those to you so we'll make sure for those requests we get those out and otherwise, I don't see any other questions popping in, but if you have any, you can always reach any of us um, at webinars at chorusdocs.com, marketing at chorusdocs.com, info at chorusdocs.com. So any any of those ways will we'll, uh, get to all of us. So I think we are probably safe to wrap it up. Okay, wonderful. Great, okay, thanks so much, everyone. Um, I hope that this was useful. I know we covered a lot of different things, um, but really um, three P's, preparation, process, and personalization. If you can get those three right, you'll already be making huge strides and increasing your win rates and improving your bottom line. So I'll leave you with that. Thank Thanks, you so everybody. much, Olivia. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.